Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for this very special screening of Los Hermanos, which is screening as part of our series Screening Cuba, which is a focus on music and dance. And we are presenting through the festival the film component, but there also is a wonderful museum exhibition um, taking place simultaneously. So if you are in Ashland, I hope you get a chance to go see it. Today, we are having a conversation with the co-directors, the co-producers of this wonderful music documentary, this family portrait of some tremendous musicians. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Marsha Jarmel and Ken Schneider. Um, they have produced and co-directed several documentary shorts and feature length films of which this film is their latest. And I did wanna, before we get into the questions, Marsha and Ken, I know this has an air date and I'm wondering if you can share that with us just up front so that people who want to tell their friends about this film, if you don't get a chance to see it again during the festival, you can look forward to it when and where. So uh, in two places, we're having a virtual theatrical release on May 14th. So it should be at your local art house, we hope. And then it will be broadcast in October on public television as part of the um, Hispanic Heritage Month programming. And the exact date, I don't know, but if anyone's interested in, you can follow us on social media or join our email list and, um, and we'll be happy to let you know when that uh, when it's available to watch in that way. Thank you. And I do actually want to give a shout out to the Los Hermanos website, which is at patchworkfilms.net. It is one of the most comprehensive film websites that I've had the pleasure to go through. So I just, um, for more what, of what we don't cover here and to keep up with the film, I really recommend people go to that website. Um, okay. Marsha and Ken, my first question for you is actually it's about the origins of your project, but I'm wondering as you're telling us about the origins of this project, you've been filming in Cuba for quite a while. And I'm just curious how you came to this project and how this project either fit in to that trajectory of making films about Cuba or how it changed you, what, if it took you in a different direction than you weren't expecting? That's a big question, but uh, before I go there, two slight um, amendments to your lovely intro, thank you. Um, if you are looking for a site, it's Patchworks Films. Both Patchworks and Films are plural, just to be clear. And also um, our film's title is a bilingual title. It's Los Hermanos the Brothers. So that's officially, it's a very long title. It doesn't fit very well on the screen, but um, that is the official title. Thank you so much for those corrections. Well, and, and just to say that the, the idea of having a bilingual title has to do with the kind of, the, the, we're, the brothers are mirrors. Um, you know, one lives in Cuba and one lives in the U.S. And, you know, the idea was always to sort of be uh, showcasing, you know, how both worlds look through both brothers' eyes. So hence the bilingual title. So to your question, um, our family's history in Havana starts in 1941, when my father, a seven-year-old refugee from Nazi-occupied Austria, fled the continent with his mother and grandmother and with the intention of joining surviving relatives in the States, but they were denied entry into the US, but they were welcomed into Havana where they spent several years in the forties. And that was part of our dinner conversation when I grew up. So Havana and Cuba to me was not a place of political aspiration or resentment. It was a place that saved my father's life. And our firstborn, uh, Micah took that as, as his own and eventually did a community project there, which took us there to make our first film in 2011. And that film had a good life in Cuba, which culminated in a, a bus tour around the country with Marsha and I on the bus with a, a group of people that had we asked to curate our perfect group travel group, this would have been it. It was a group of artists and creators and ideas people, a photographer, the, the rock star of the moment, a gender studies um, academic, a wonderful singer of Trova, the sort of 
the, the, the troubadour aspect of, of Cuban song and people like this. And we discovered, gee, we thought we knew Cuba as a place of popular dance and music, but actually there's much deeper artistic and cultural um, heritages there, which include classical music. And it's a particular blend of classical music, which we hadn't yet heard before, but I was introduced to on a subsequent trip when I went to the opening night of Havana Jazz Fest and saw a 35 year old wild haired pianist named Aldo Lopez Gavilan perform and, and, and did things with a piano that I had not yet experienced as a as a, uh, an amateur aficionado of, uh, of piano music. And I came back uh, to San Francisco after that trip and said to Marcia, hey, we're looking for an, our next story in Cuba. Uh, I, I, I think I found it. Um, and I described my experience at the concert and Marcia being the producer said to me, sounds great. What's the story? And we had been looking for, we were interested in the arts after that bus tour and kind of looking at how Cuba was changing through the lens of art because art has a very particular uh, place in Cuban uh, culture. Um, so, so I was interested in the music, but looking for a story. And then we were fortunate enough to have a screening in New York of another one of our films. And, uh, and Ilmar, Aldo's brother came. We had a lovely time together. Um, and he said, uh, you know, Aldo's coming. And we had no idea. Mm. Um, he said, he's coming for his first tour with my quartet. And we thought, okay, that's a story. We don't know what's gonna happen, but something's gonna happen when these two brothers get together. And six or eight weeks later, we were filming. And re remember, sorry, Laura, one more note on that. Remember that this uh, this lunch meeting or brunch meeting with, with Ilmar and the revelation that Aldo was coming was played out against the canvas of, um, of President Obama's changing of our country's poor relationship with Cuba. That event would not have happened six months earlier and certainly not two years later after the Trump administration was elected. So it was a, there was a tiny window where Cuban American cultural and business exchange um, was restored for the first time since the 1950s. So when you were making the film, because it's a tour, it's a family portrait, um, you have the backdrop of the, the relationship between the US and Cuba. I'm curious if you could talk about how you came to the structure of the film um, and how you found the, what I love so much about the film is how the synthesis of all the sort of the seamless synthesis synthesis of these different levels. And I'm wondering, there's such a balance. Could you talk about how you came to the structure? Like if, if you had something like you started it, it was going to be this, and then it became yeah. that. Um, and, well, can I just say one, sure. one thing? So, so, um, well, one thing is that we edited for quite a while because the story was evolving mm -hmm. over time. But uh, the other thing is that we, we had this idea of doing a, a kind of musical suite um, and having a piece of music with each um, kind of each part of the each uh, step in their journey. Um, so the film evolved as um, as the story evolved and as our understanding of what we were doing evolved. But uh, Ken's uh, edited, so he can speak more to that. Well, I mean, you're asking sort of a big um, question, Laura, about the alchemy of documentary film editing. And in remember, in uh, in a fiction film, you the director creates a universe over which they exercise total control. In documentary, we as directors enter into a universe over which we have almost zero control. Our commitment is to being present and to having the camera roll when reality is unfolding in front of the lens and try to have as little influence on that reality in the moment um, and then shape it in the editing room. So I think the final version was uh, that you saw is probably version 38 of the film. So it's a process of iteration. I know that sounds quite vague, but we tried many, many things, but where we landed always was um, in what we feel is heart forward filmmaking. So the issues the politics are kind of middle ground to background. They are the canvas against which a story takes place, but we're clear that this is about family um, who has been 
thrown apart by circumstance, part of which is their choice, but I mean, they left by choice, but they didn't stay apart by choice. They stayed apart because of, of poor politics, um, not their own, but of, um, uh, of the leaders of their respective countries, particularly, um, set, tragically, um, uh, the US's policy, which prohibits the kind of cultural and trade exchange that that family so wanted. And it just took us a while to get that balance of foreground, which is family, love, reunification, creation, in this case of music, and background, which is politics and history. And, and trying to figure out how much history people needed. What, what do people actually know, most of the audience? Um, and so, you know, so we had test screenings and kind of figured out what, you know, just enough so that people could understand the context of the story. There would be no story if there wasn't that political context, um, but not too much that we were sort of lecturing. Well, I, th I think you do a really, as I said, it's sort of a seamless synthesis. And what one of the things that really struck me about the film was how you really, there's so much music in it. Hmm. So much music. And actually, I would like to ask if you could maybe give us a little bit of an update on Aldo and Ilmar now, if, if, if you have any news, because I know that we'd love to have an update. And also, um, I noticed on your website that it's possible the, the album that they're recording is now available. Um, and I think you, you have it on your website, is that correct? Yes, yeah, yeah. So we have, um, one of my favorite places on the website is our listen page, mm -hmm. where we have um, a link to the, the album that was created. Um, it's not the soundtrack of the film, but it was created as, as part of, of what happened when we made the film. Um, so there's that, but there's also links to all kinds of other music, you know, videos of them performing, of all the, the their kind of extended family of musicians of them performing. And there's a lot of lovely stuff there, including that link. Um, and in terms of where they are now, um, we are super excited because they are planning a tour together again in, uh, in the fall. They're gonna be performing uh, a couple times this spring and summer, hopefully live. Um, uh, and then in the fall, they will be touring together because Aldo just got a visa, which took them forever to get a, uh, a visa so that he could would be able to come and perform. So that's, you know, that's kind of the good news. So in the meantime, um, uh, Aldo is making music in, in Cuba and putting out some videos with new music that he's writing. And, and Ilmar is... Um, rehearsing at home, waiting for his quartet to go back on the road, so. Um, one of the things I, I, I know that when you're, um, you're, the story that you tell about uh, traveling with Havana uh, Curveball, which was documenting your son's project. Um, and I was struck by how similar that is. You're a family on tour, um, th that you are on tour. And I'm just curious, um, if you could talk about how you worked with this very unique family, um, was the trust there from the beginning? Um, you, you get access to amazing footage, um, both you know the home movies and a lot of archival footage. And I'm just wondering if you could talk about how you build trust, like what were, what were, the, what were the connections you were able to establish that really let you experience those moments. Like you definitely see with the airport pickups and the screw ups, I definitely got the older brother, younger brother dynamic. I could see that very clearly and which I was glad you included. But um, if you could talk about it, because it sense all those first. Uh, yeah. Our first shoot was yeah. Well, Laura, you hit uh, you you hit on the two key words uh, of documentary directing, and this time, Marsha and I also we are sometimes college professors of film, and um, I always talk about the need for access and trust, which is uh, exactly what makes possible the work we do. I mean, we are not the news. We do not parachute in and we're there for 15 minutes and we're out. You know, this, we shot over a year and a half, not every day, certainly. And sometimes months went by, but we, we filmed over a long time. And the advantage of that is you, you can deepen relationship with the subjects. 
Um, I'm also a Spanish speaker, which is a big help. And um, the more time we spend without the camera, the better the shooting is. Part of the art of documentary is knowing when to take the camera off your lap and, and roll. Um, so, you know, and, sometimes- with, and, and um, Just to jump in, the other thing is that we always work with a, um, a Cuban crew. We don't bring our own crew and we don't bring our own gear. So, um, you know, there's, there's uh, a group of Cubans who are in the, and, and us. So it, uh, it has a different vibe than if you're kind of parachuting in um, from the outside. And, and that uh, gives us not only the, the kind of access that, um, you know, uh, cultural connection, um, but also insight into when, when we're not understanding what's, what's happening because of, uh, you know, cross-cultural differences. So we learn a lot from our crew, um, which are really, you know, collaborators in, in telling the story and understanding the story. So as opposed to showing up with an all US crew and we appear as the Bank of America, you know, we, we go there and we, um, I, I don't assume that anybody, uh, um, that it's our right to film anybody. I assume that it is our privilege uh, if somebody agrees to appear in front of our camera. Um, that all said, I mean, it sounds like I'm a very humble person, which I'm not. Um, first day of shooting with Aldo, we had, I had met him casually at several of his concerts over the past few years. When I emailed him, he pretended that he remembered me, but I think he really didn't. Um, but I was very taken by him already because I'd seen him perform both classical and jazz um, a bunch of times in Cuba. And um, so we arranged to appear to show up at his apartment and do a day of shooting. I now describe all the things we wanted to do. We wanted to do an interview, want to film you and your family, want to see the, your twin daughters, you and your wife, because she's a wonderful conductor, and just kind of hang out with you. And that would be the first of two days of shooting. And then we'll meet you in the States when you go on tour with your brother and his quartet. So we, we went that day, we showed up with our all Cuban crew. We had a, a pretty good shoot. It was pretty low key from our point of view. We did a, a good interview and a couple of other small scenes. And then we got a call from a mutual friend that night who said, hey, Aldo just called me and he's really freaked out. He said, you guys worked him really hard. And uh, Marsha, I looked at each other and thought that was like the lowest key day of shooting we've had in 10 years, you know? So, so, so the, the thing we realized <laughs> is that, I mean, they're, they're famous in Cuba. They're on television all the time. Um, you know, their concerts and, and their expectation of what it means to have a film crew comes as you come and do a 20 minute interview and film a little B-roll and then you leave. And um, that we hadn't really done a, a deep enough explanation of what it means to be in the kind of documentary that we were envisioning for this. So the next day we showed up without the camera and we had that conversation which then uh, opened the door and, you know, over, over time we were able to, you know, deepen our uh, relationship and, um, and, you know, trust and access, which but, comes with that. But also Laura, there's, you know, there's a, there's a particular vibration between director and subject, or we're trying in the documentary world not to use words like subject and character, um, but subject is a, is an easier one for us to use for this conversation. So, uh, it took a while for Aldo to open up to us. And maybe it was because of that first day, or maybe that's because he was a little more reticent being a person of note in Cuba. Um, he wasn't necessarily sure of our motivations. You know, here we are, even though we're, we're well-meaning, we are American, we come in. He doesn't know if we're making a film to build our career or if we're really doing a deep explanation. So it took a lot of shoots for him to really open up at the heart level to us. Ilmar, on the other hand, the violinist brother who's been in New York for much of his life, we had instant kismet with him. You know, from that first brunch, um, he was great. He's a, he's a raconteur, a, a great storyteller. And with or without the camera, you know, Ilmar is a pleasure to be around. And there was, there was never a question there uh, really of access or relationship. It was there from our first smile. So part of it is is what we bring, and part of it is the particular you know um, uh, moment uh, between you know director and subject. Um, will Los Hermanos, the brothers, um, has it screened yet in Cuba, or what are the plans that you have to bring it to Cuba? Yeah, so um, a couple of things. Uh, it's first live performance. 
uh, was in Cuba at the Havana Film Festival, which is a big Latin American uh, film festival. And very sadly, we were not there. It was in December. Um, they're doing much better than we are. Um, so they were able to have live, um, you know, socially distanced screenings. And we, we heard that it was great and very well appreciated. They have invited us to, uh, they're going to do a kind of redux when things open up. So we're hoping we can be there for another screening. We'll see. Uh, about that, but it also will, it'll play on Cuban television uh, eventually, um, and and probably have some other screenings at um, various kind of art venues that we we are connected with in Havana. Um, it brings me actually to a a bigger question, um, which I know um, for some of our audience they may not they, it may be a new concept to them, but for many documentaries these days, um, impact campaigns are a key part of making, um, it's, it's not, you don't just make the documentary, but then there's where does, how does the documentary live on? And a lot of times uh, that, that's through the impact campaign. And you have a very interesting impact campaign and I'm that which the website does uh, cover extensively but I'd love to hear you share your hopes for beyond this beyond watching this film where you hope this film takes people thank you so much for asking that that's my work usually after the uh, the film is finished so um, we have a, in a funny way um, luckily, our film has come out at a time when there's a lot of discussion uh, about um, inclusion in, uh, and diversity in all kinds of realms. And uh, it's happening in the world of classical music. A lot of pretty much every classical music institution is now asking themselves, you know, who is playing this music and, and what's considered part of the canon? You know, uh, what gets played? And, uh, you know, the statistics are, uh, I think two per two percent of just under two percent of the classical music core in the U.S. are African American, and slightly over two percent are Latinx. So, so there are wonderful organizations doing work around this. Um, the Sphinx organization, for one, um, uh, they've been doing this for you know twenty five years, where they've been working to support um, the building careers for African-American musicians. So we are working with, uh, with them and with uh, music institutions, um, you know, both venues and um, like music programs, uh, after school programs and, and, and other uh, kinds of things to, to show the film as really as a way of, of having that conversation because it's so rare to see um, people with, um, with our brother's skin tone um, headlining uh, performances in the way that they do in the film. Um, and I, uh, I don't wanna do a spoiler, but there's, there's some wonderful um, uh, moments in the film where you really see that they are kind of integrating spaces where, which are pretty much completely white. And, uh, and for us, um, the, for the film to have that kind of ongoing life and to be really supporting um, this, you know, kind of lovely and important work um, is, is fantastic. And we are, um, just to say, if, uh, you know, we're looking for other opportunities. So we've shown it to high school classes, we've shown it to after school music programs, we've shown it, we're gonna have a screening at Carnegie Hall uh, at the end of April. So, uh, you know, we're, we're quite excited about all the, the possibilities in that realm, as well as as the uh, kind of traditional uh, film uh, distribution. I, I was, I, I found some of the most um, touching moments of the film um, where with um, what, when um, Ilmar is in rehearsal with the, his quartet with the students in the audience and just the, the sense of recognition and um, connection that you capture with your camera of them listening to the music and it just, it's a really lot, they're just a lot of, and, and a lot of the performance, um, it, the film just, it really celebrates our humanity in ways that um, at least in this moment seem particularly poignant. So again, um, congratulations. I, I guess, um, 
to, I want to, I'd, I'd love to talk to you more, but it's probably time that we think about wrapping up. And I wanted to ask you um, if there was something, I, I find a lot of times when we are encountering artists um, and we interact with artists, whether, you know, however it is that they, they touch something in us that surprises us, that makes us think, I never thought that way before, or it opens us up in certain ways. And Ken, I'm just gonna riff off of something where you were talking about your heart forward kind of filmmaking. So it seems that you're really open to your subjects. And I'm wondering if there's anything that happened during the filming um, that was a surprise. I'm sure there were a lot of surprises, but I'm just wondering if there were any, for each of you, a particular moment that is just like a keepsake that actually impacted you as an artist? Uh, no. You are another, right. Another big question, I'm sorry. You're right, <laughs> there are many. No, it's a, it's a really good question because um, we, you know, again, when we teach, we talk a lot about the, I talk a lot about when the director, you know, makes a documentary, you are, um, you're not, you know, scripting it, you are, growing with the story. Um, and if you can't do that, then your story is sort of locked, um, you know, etched in stone before you start. So anyway, um, you know, I, yeah, there was a, a moment for me, uh, it, it, it's connected to a, a, a song that Aldo wrote for the film, which is, um, I won't do a spoiler alert, but you know where it is in the, in the film, Laura. And, um, uh, we had engaged Aldo to to write, we want him to score the whole film, but where we eventually landed is that we would use music that he's written and uh, just have him write a little bit of original stuff for the film. And so he sent us, um, uh, you know, we gave him this notion and a couple months went by and we didn't hear a thing and we're getting a little antsy because, you know, timeline and deadlines and all this festivals, you know. And so I called him, I said, well, you know, you have anything? He said, well, I, I, I have a little melody in mind. And I was a little bit, you know, upset. I didn't want to reveal that because I really trust his process and believe he's one of the best pianists on the planet. And uh, I said, I'd love to hear something. He said, well, you know, all I have now is like, you know what MIDI is when you kind of electronically link together your musical instruments? He said, all I have is just some MIDI samples of it. I said, well, you know, I'm a music guy. I can, I can feel it. Send me what you have. So he begrudgingly sent us what he had, which you know sounded like um, like a little toy piano. It just it sounded like like nothing. And I heard it, and I I said, "Ay they, this is not this is not my beautiful house. This is not what I what I had in mind." Um, but I had to go with the process, which you learn often in filmmaking. And uh, I didn't actually hear it until we we got in the studio that day and he started playing. And Marsha and I were in the control room with the wonderful sound engineer who had been a composition student at Juilliard. And he understood music in a way that we didn't. And um, he became a valued collaborator that day. And the two brothers are playing the song and I'm in the control room and I'm, I'm weeping, literally, you know? And, um, and it's a song which I, found myself in um, because of the, the subject of the song. Uh, it, was, it was their story, but it's also mine and also our collective story. And uh, I guess, is there a simple lesson from that? You know, when you are on the trail with a really good story, it will take, it will take you. You no longer take it. When I get back to the editing room, then I regain, um, Sort of control of the story but during production when we're out there with the camera when we're you know booking plane tickets when we're in hotel rooms we just have to get on the bus thank you for that marcia did you have a, a well i i think i'm going to speak uh in a sort of general way about this film because to be making this film at this time when there's just so much darkness out there it was such a a privilege and we were so lucky to be in the editing room with this music every day 
and with this these brothers and this family because it really reminds you of the importance of beauty and love and the possibility of crossing borders and what happens when we allow that. And so um, just for me personally, which of course is connected to the work I do in the world, uh, it just was like, it was a heart opener and a, a reminder to not just be <laughs> locked down in that fearful place, which is so easy to go to right now. So um, I think I would say that. Well, I, I want to, again, congratulate the two of you because, um, Ken, with the, the section that you're talking about, there is, there is a moment where the music just sort of, it creeps in and it just, it's right there. And it's, um, and Marsha, to your point of the beauty of that and the, the importance of holding on to that, um, especially in more challenging times. Um, I want to thank you both for joining us. Uh, we look forward to a lot of people seeing this film, more and more people um, as it rolls out across the country and across screens in the coming months. Um, and wish you all the best. Thank you for being with us. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much yeah. It's been great talking to you.